So, hello Lars, we are back from channel one. Now here to channel two and hello. we have Lars at next. Um, yeah, welcome back. Um, here's the one and only Sven Peterson, uh, Mr. Abab Git himself. Um, for me, uh, words can't explain what he's doing with and for ABAP and for all the, the ABAP developers in the, in the sub community. Um, for example, he gave us ABAP Git, ABAP Merge, ABAP Lint, ABAP Objects, and so many, many, many more things. Um, for me, he really re enabled open source in the, in the ABAP community. And therefore, a big thank for this. Thank you, Lars. Um, and now we have uh, another talk from him, microservices in ABAP. Lars, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. So welcome everybody to uh, this session on, uh, on ABAP. And um, do note uh, that today, this is the outer space uh, track. So uh, we will be going a bit crazy uh, as uh, Carl Kester just uh, mentioned on, uh, on channel one. And also, uh, as this uh, session is, is in English, please keep the uh, chat in uh, YouTube also in English here for channel one for, uh, for this specific session. So this is the first uh, ABAP conference. Um, so um, for every conference, there is, of course, there is some, uh, some uh, announcements, right? And I thought, well, of course, we also need announcements for the, uh, for the ABAP conference. So. Um, yeah, hello, this is me. So let's start with uh, with announcements. So announcement number one, not related to microservices, but also a bit related to microservices. So um, on the internet, there is this uh, cool uh, website called Exorcism that is a, a non-profit open source homepage to um, help people uh, learn different uh, programming languages. And as... Um, as Tobias mentioned in the keynote in the early morning, ABAP is kind of a uh, anti-pattern of a modern programming language, right? But does it really have to be like that, right? Uh, and some of the difficult parts with ABAP is actually getting started. So uh, what we've been working on, and shout out to, uh, to Mark Bernard that's doing a parallel session, and Mike and Jöran that has also be been helping uh, setting this up. We can just try it out and um, Domi, you should have shared the link in the chat. So uh, for the slides, so if you go into the slides on slide three, there's a link. Uh, this is available now for everyone in the entire world. The language track is not enabled. There are still some things to be done, but we'll just do a quick, uh, quick uh, live demo here if it works. They had some problems. So as you can see here, this is the ABAP track for exorcism. Currently, we have a uh, eight total exercises. And just for a quick uh, demo, let's do the reverse string exercise. So, um, so actually, every exercise on exorcism contains uh, of some instructions that you see over here, some, um, some test cases that you see over here. So this is ABAP unit test cases, and then an implementation. So, um, as a student in, uh, in Exorcism, it's your job to change the source code so it actually um, um, provides the expected results. And in this case, the expected result is to reverse the string. So I can do a reverse because ABAP is a cool programming language. We have the reverse uh, operator built in. I can do run tests. Now it will take the ABAP code, run, run it, execute the unit test, and see if uh, the unit tests uh, fail or succeed. And again, do note there is no installation here. There is nothing happening. All you need to do is sign in, open the editor, write some ABAP code, get started, learn ABAP. And luckily, I was able to, uh, to actually complete this session. So, so that's cool, yeah. So, so hopefully, something like this will help um, everybody in the entire world um, um, actually uh, learn more ABAP and get a more larger community, will get more exercises so people can start using uh, ABAP units that has been talked about a lot uh, during the day, right? 
Um, but again, volunteers needed, so we need some people to uh, to actually help building these exercises. So please uh, reach out if uh, if you'd like to help building this way. And, and again, note everything here is open source. You can find the source code uh, in um, in GitHub. Right? That was announcement one. We'll get moving along. Announcement two. So. Um, uh, as we saw Frank uh, Jens uh, in the morning uh, talking about steampunk and embedded steampunk and some of the questions in the chat was how, how do I actually figure out if something is released or not. So one possibility is to go into a steampunk system, look up the uh, release contract and see if it's released or not. Um, to me that's a lot of work because then I need to start Eclipse, I need to log in and sign up for a system. So. Um, and especially when doing open source, we and also do normal business um, uh, logic, right? You like to use things that are released. So here is the links to the first two uh, uh, attempts on making uh, uh, some public information as to uh, what is marked as released in uh, uh, in a steampunk system. So here is an example again for a, um, this is a data element. This will uh, hopefully be um, become better over time and the list will be extended, but this is the first attempt and uh, it's public, everybody can use it. And you can also use this for, uh, for doing uh, static syntax checks. Okay, cool. Let's, um, Let's get into the uh, the real part of um, of uh, these slides, and um, today I'll actually start by doing a, a live demo. So may the demo gods be with us. There is a link uh, in the slides um, to um, uh, the example that we're going through, and Domi has shared the links in the slides somewhere in the chat room. So. This is public. Everyone can uh, can start uh, taking a look and trying this out from now. Yeah. Okay, going into live demo, I'll switch to my editor. So, um, as you see here, uh, this is my editor of choice. Um, I choose to use uh, Visual Studio Code for editing uh, my source code, and talking about editors, right? So, uh, so the, um, the traditional uh, talk, uh, never ending discussion in, a, in, a, in, in the computer, computer industry is, do you choose to use VI or Emacs, right? And that's a never ending discussion, right? But there is some similarities between the, these two editors, right? Both VI and Emacs can be extended uh, very, very much and it's easy to extend for the developers, right? And that's also the reason that I choose to use Visual Studio Code to be my favorite editor because I can I can extend it by um, by adding extensions uh, and writing those in JavaScript, right? Comparing with something like SE eighteen, it's more or less not possible to uh, to do extensions or, or change it to SE eighty. Personally, I also find it very difficult for me to make extensions to ADT. Anyhow, what we see here is, um, is some ABAP code um, inside the Visual Studio code. And somebody asked earlier today, how do I install the uh, ABAP extensions here for Visual Studio code? And I'll just show them. You can go to extensions, search for ABAP, enter. And then there is the list of, um, of different uh, ABAP uh, language extensions that you can, um, can choose. There is this one by um, Marcello Urbani that um, lets your Visual Studio Code connect via the ADT REST endpoints directly to your SAP system. As you can see, I don't have this installed right now. I'm, ex I'm uh, using my extension that is called ABAP Lint. So this is an extension running um, um, running in um, um, completely on the local PC without a, um, um, an ABAP backend. And as I mentioned at the beginning, please keep the, uh, the chat in YouTube uh, in, in English because I keep this, uh, this session in English, thank you. So this is running 
directly in the browser in, um, in uh, Visual Studio Code without any other system. All my files here is, of course, just files on the local file system. So I will have cloned the example from GitHub to my local PC. And actually, if you, if you take a look here and say, if I edit something, then I get immediate feedback of, um, um, of any syntax errors. So that's because the linter runs on the local PC inside Visual Studio Code. I can also, if I, if I change the string to, uh, to something else, this is then a type that is not known. But anyhow, first thing here that I made is a, um, an interface that I call uh, ABAP serverless. So this is basically just a freestyle uh, HTTP um, wrapper, right? Just like uh, Frank showed the freestyle um, uh, HTTP service in Steampunk. This could also be the basis of a freestyle um, um, uh, ACDP service, right? Then next thing I've done is that I've taken um, and made a new class in a file, implement the interface and implemented the, uh, the code to run this interface, right? And this is the, the ABAP implementation, right? On the side of that, I've chosen to make this example uh, with the Asia functions. And yeah, why Asia functions? Yeah, because it seemed easy, right? I, this could also be, uh, be lambdas or um, Cloudflare workers, whatever, right? But let's just uh, take this ABAP code um, and, and run it, right? So uh, there's two uh, commands here that you have to run. npm install, cancel, npm test. This will now take the ABAP code, put it inside a uh, Asia functions um, serverless uh, runtime, and then start that runtime on my local system. Yeah. So if I open this endpoint, put it on, put it on. We'll now see the result from ABAP and Git. So that's exactly what the uh, what the implementation here says. I can also try to add a query parameter. Well, no. Yeah, that actually worked. And just to show you that I'm not actually uh, cheating here, I can also uh, try changing some of the um, code here to a uh, recompilation. Room. And it will now run again. And it now has the uh, DSTF change here. And of course, this is a, this is an Asia function service, so we can you can choose to deploy that to any any uh, to uh, Asia the way that these functions are um, um, uh, are deployed, right? Then you can try this out today. Easy, right? So what actually makes up a microservice? So um, a microservice is something about being loosely coupled, independent, deployable, autonomous, aligned with a boundary context, focused on one task, small, not technology bound. But all of this is actually open to interpretation, right? So. In my example, I did some very easy ABAP code, right? Um, but ABAP is a programming language, in my opinion, just like any other programming language, right? It's not a, um, what was to be a said, he said uh, an anti-pattern. It is a programming language. And, and in microservices, you make something that is small. My example was very small. You keep, keep track of your dependencies, right? And as we've seen in, in a lot of open source ABAP projects, we can implement everything in ABAP, right? So you can, you can take any ABAP code, put it into a microservice and have it run there, right? But of course, all of this is open to interpretation, right? So how, how big should uh, a microservice be? How small should it be, right? Um, it's up to you to decide, right? But actually, so, so how is, <laughs> So I just showed this running, right? Um, 
I didn't really show how it works. Um, and that was on purpose because there's a lot of stories behind this. Um, and all of this is custom runtime. And of course, making an attempt, attempting to making a custom runtime for ABAP um, uh, starts with actually passing the ABAP code. And that's not very easy. So the first step to actually, to actually be done, right, is actually passing the ABAP code. One step for this that I've spent quite a lot of time on is manually creating the syntax trees, uh, attempting to make the syntax trees for ABAP right. And these you can access via syntax.abaplint.org. Um, of course, this is not perfect, right? And there is a lot of bugs in, and bug re reports are, of course, welcome. Um, but on the other hand, the F1 help in, uh, in, uh, in the ABAP editor or ADT is also not perfect. That is also not 100% correct. So, so there is really no, uh, no official, that I know of at least, documentation of exactly what is the structure of the program languages. This is my attempt. Um, this attempt runs pretty well on a, on a lot of open source code. So it is pretty much good enough. Then having known, um, known a lot of things about the language, right? Then, um, then you can actually start making a static um, um, analysis rules on top of that. Right? So as we've seen earlier today in the, um, in the clean, um, uh, clean ABAP track, they, they talked a lot about all these rules, ATC and CodePal and ABAP open checks, right? But when developing ABAP Git and a lot of other open source projects, we actually use the, uh, the ABAP Lint project that runs on every commit um, for a lot of open source ABAP code every day. This is uh, completely configurable. And if you're interested in clean ABAP, you can click this uh, small button here to enable the filtering of the rules. Uh, that are actually valid for uh, the ABAP clean ABAP uh, style guide. And all of this can be configured and runs inside the uh, uh, GitHub typically on every commit. So everything is checked every time um, and everything runs via the normal Git flow that you do for any programming language in, in, uh, in GitHub, right? So that also means that we don't really use exemptions. We don't really use uh, pragmas. We, we don't have false positives. So whenever there is a false positive in the linter, we just fix it. Because why not fix the false positives instead of having them show up, right? So over, over some time rights, the linter, um, actually uh, started uh, to know a lot about the, uh, the ABAP language as such, right? But still, there's a, it's actually quite a step in actually knowing something about the language to actually having it running, right? So, um, so last year during um, Advent of Code, we, uh, it's me and, uh, and a guy from Sweden, we spend a lot of time actually implementing the Advent on code solutions in ABAP running uh, locally um, via, via, via this setup, right? And over the last year, this has improved quite a lot. So now we see these uh, microservices, microservices coming up, right? Another use case for this is that we actually, on every push in ABAP Git, whenever somebody develops ABAP Git, it actually runs uh, just in, uh, 280 something unit tests on every push via this setup. So I say via this setup, what is this setup, right? So let's, let's just see that uh, with, uh, with our fingers here. Oops. Just close some of this. So, what it actually does is that it, it transpiles the ABAP code to JavaScript that can then be um, uh, executed um, on a microservice platform on the node stack, right? 
this is a, an example of this where I have the, uh, the other code. And again, this is just a browser. You can open this in your browser via the link that, uh, that is in the slide. So you can try this out today, right now. Uh, and of course, there are bugs and bug reports are very much welcome. I have some other code over here. This is the result of the, uh, the transpile. And this is the result of running the transpile code that is transitively the result of, uh, of actually uh, running the other code, right? So let's write some other code. Um, who equals 42? Let me just scroll this window to the left, right? So then we do a, like I do a two times, right? And do. Again, this is a syntax error, right? I get the syntax error directly in the browser developing our code. And instantly, as I actually fix the, uh, uh, the syntax error in the other code, it is transpiled into JavaScript code that is then executed in the browser. And I get the result directly on the fly of actually running this other code. And this is actually exactly what is happening inside the, uh, the example that we saw. So if you take a, a, a nice look at uh, the example here, if you actually chose to, uh, to clone it from, uh, from GitHub, right? So we have the other code. This other code is actually first, as you see, I am using some cool new language syntax here, like the value operator, right? Cool. Um, so the transpiler is quite limited. It does not understand all of this new stuff, right? It's from the old days. So the first step that actually happens when compiling this, uh, this microservice is that it downports the code automatically, again, while running uh, the linter, right? So this is the input, this is the output. So it takes the 740 something uh, code here down post to something that is a 702 compatible. Again, automatically, we didn't touch anything. This happens automatically. The next step after having the other code, it actually transpires that along with some other stuff into, this was the trick, into some JavaScript code. So if we just open these two next to each other, you actually see some similarities of the, uh, of the code uh, over here with actually the, um, the JavaScript code that is over here, right? So now we have all taken all the other code, made it into, um, into JavaScript that can run on Node.js and then to, uh, to hook it all together with the, um, um, the Asia framework, there is a piece of code here Blah, 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 blah. So this is the, uh, the actually handler for the Asia function. So it's just hooking this, hooking the call to the transpiled other code into the, uh, into the Asia function, right? And this can be any, any other code. You can try it yourself, put in anything. Of course, it, it needs to keep track of dependencies. So, so if you use a data element here, it has to know the data element in the source code, right? in our git format. Yeah, five minutes left. And I added a, um, a nice drawing here. Um, and as you can see, um, this is of course a, uh, a drawing or a diagram of a landscape of, if you click it and scroll up, of the microservices at Uber. So, um, so just saying, perhaps microservices is not always the solution to everything, right? So having microservices, you still need to manage your dependencies. Uh, you need to keep a uh, close track of everything, right? Um, so microservices does not solve everything. It might solve some things, right? 
Um, now we're at least one step closer to actually making microservices in ABAP, right? So if you have some cool isolated ABAP code, you can just put it in a microservice uh, and, um, uh, and run it, right? So like running a web server for, for a, a serving a static HTML pages for serving agendas for conferences, you can now implement that in ABAP, right? If you wish so. Yeah, again, keep very much track of your dependencies, right? So um, this is actually something that we do a lot in, um, in open source. So if you open source ABAP, so if you, if you go into some of the open source ABAP projects, you see that we actually define dependencies to other open source ABAP projects to actually do the static analysis of your local project into, into another project, right? Take a look at the um, at some open source examples. We do this every day. So what we'll actually see here is that answering the uh, the, the question from um, from Domi that will come when we meet the speakers. So what we're actually moving into here is uh, something that um, is a. Uh, is more or less multi-target ABAP applications, right? So if you have strict control of your dependencies, you know your languages, you know your um, um, static analysis that you switch to the max to have full static analysis on, on everything. You can actually make code that runs on 702. You can make code that runs on, uh, on the same code that runs on 755. You can have the same code that runs on Steampunk. And you can also have the same code that runs in the browser, right? One last example here for actually running stuff in the browser. So of course, microservices are connected, right? And there is one other open source project or organization called ABAP-OpenAPI that aims to provide connectivity for uh, between uh, ABAP stacks and other, other areas, right? So if you know OpenAPI, it's a specification, a bit like OData. So what I've done is actually I've written a, a, a client generation generator in ABAP to generate ABAP clients for OpenAPI. And I wrote that in ABAP, right? Because everything is ABAP. And actually, this also, this is kind of a multi-target ABAP application because the ABAP, wrote ABAP code to generate ABAP, that ABAP code I transpile into JavaScript that I can now run the browser. That will take the open API definition here and on the fly generate the code for one ABAP interface and one ABAP class to actually call open API services from ABAP, right? And again, this is ABAP running in the browser, passing the JSON, generating code. So this is not trivial, right? It's not as trivial as the examples that we just saw. This is actually real logic, right? Yeah, so um, just remember, ABAP is not dead. Uh, ABAP will keep shining for a million of years. And the slides should already be shared in the uh, YouTube chat. You can find me on, uh, on Twitter, right? And for questions, uh, 25 minutes past five, uh, European Central Time. So uh, see you there, prepare all your questions or uh, open an issue on GitHub uh, somewhere, send me a message on Twitter. Yeah, we're on time, Domi, right? Perfect, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Lars, for this off amazing session as it was really mind-blowing um out of space track. yeah I, I i really i'm really happy that that you ended on time because i really need a break before we we go into the next session uh, and i'm sure there will be uh, some questions in the meet of speaker uh at 1725 as you mentioned perfect thank you Lars. thank you so much it was really great uh yeah thanks